In my few short years serving the 4th District of South Carolina in Congress, I've watched a once proud city succumb to violent crime, vagrancy, and fall into lawlessness. There are many factors at play here, but the bottom line is this. I want to, in good faith, tell parents from my district that it's safe for the kids to come visit the nation's capital on their school trip. But right now, I can't do that. I actually do the exact opposite when people come to, come to my office. I tell them that D.C. is not safe. They should take Ubers. We have to respect the rule of law. We have to respect law enforcement. We have to fund law enforcement. We should have 3,000 law enforcement officers in, the, in Washington, D.C. You're going to be down to 1,500 here shortly because of the way that the city council treats law enforcement. It is unacceptable. The gentleman from South Carolina lectured the people of Washington, D.C. about um, criminal incidents uh, taking place here. Um, and uh, of course, there are criminal incidents taking place also in South Carolina uh, in the exact same way. But how about something that took place even closer to home? How about the violent mob insurrection where a mob incited by the ex-president violently assaulted Capitol Police officers and Metropolitan Police Department officers who were forced to deploy to the Capitol, and nearly 150 of them ended up brutalized, wounded, and hospitalized after being hit over the head or in the chest or stabbed or speared by steel pipes, Confederate battle flags, Trump flags, and American flags, shamefully. And yet we have the ex-president and a number of people who are his sycophants over on that side of the aisle describing people who are in jail for that, a majority of them having pled guilty for those offenses, the others convicted after due process of law, calling those people hostages. A hostage is someone who's been illegally abducted by a terrorist or a criminal entity like Hamas and held for a financial or a political ransom. And yet, shamefully, there are people on that side of the aisle who call the prisoners who've been convicted after, giving, after having been given every aspect of American due process and right to counsel, they're calling them hostages or political prisoners, like Alexei Navalny or Nelson Mandela. That's where they've come to. So they want to denounce a criminal event that happened six blocks away. What about the massive criminal event, the most massive criminal event in the history of the nation's capital that came right into this chamber, forcing the senators and the representatives to flee? And they won't say a word about it, and yet they get up and they denounce lawlessness. And they won't even denounce lawlessness that comes right into the Congress and the capital of the United States. I thank my, my friend from Florida, and I was about to comment that Sooner or later, you had to expect that the debate would be a rant about Donald Trump. But let's get back to the subject matter at hand, perhaps. And here's what the gentleman from Maryland said, the law professor of the, Thomas Jefferson would understand. But the, the law, the, the Constitution that Thomas Jefferson signed said the Congress shall have power to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles square, as may, by session of particular states and the acceptance of Congress, become the seat of government of the United States and to exercise like authority over all places purchased. So that's pretty clear. It's not only the question of the interests of the 700,000 roughly D.C. citizens, it is the 19 million Americans who come to this seat of government every year and are threatened by the recklessness of the D.C. Council. I do have to correct uh, my friend in his history because there might be some students watching this. Thomas Jefferson never signed the Constitution. He was, of course, on a diplomatic mission when the Constitution uh, was being signed in Philadelphia, but he did write the Declaration of Independence. Um, so the other side says um, th bizarrely that the District of Columbia Council and the mayor should be denied the authority to increase criminal sentences forthwith um, because they've shown no inclination to increase criminal sentences. Well, leave aside the absolute illogic of the argument. It's also false because the District of Columbia in the Secure DC Act passed just two months ago increased criminal sentences across the board, which I'm afraid my friends were completely oblivious to when they started this legislation. They weren't aware of it. 
the people who are claiming to be speaking for the populace of Washington, D.C., didn't know that the council had just acted to dramatically increase criminal penalties um, in the city. Then they deny them the right to further increase uh, criminal penalties in the city because they say they haven't shown any inclination to do so, which of course makes no sense and is also completely false. All of this is pure political theater. It's bad political theater. Somebody decided a long time ago that it works for people who would never try to kick around their own state legislatures, their own county councils, or their own city councils to kick around the people of Washington, D.C. My friends think that they've scored some kind of huge rhetorical coup pointing out Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the Constitution, which indeed says that Congress shall exercise exclusive legislation over the district, district constituting the seat of government from land that is ceded by various states. Nobody on this side of the aisle, including the distinguished general lady from the District of Columbia, has denied that for a second. But what we have said is this is a massive assault on home rule, and it's also an embarrassing one because it cuts completely against all of the rhetoric that we're hearing from our colleagues across the aisle. Uh, I think we've made some progress in this conversation because a plain reading of this distinguished gentleman from Florida's legislation indicates that what he's telling the District of Columbia is you may never increase criminal penalties again. The only time there can be an increase in criminal penalties in the District of Columbia is if Congress does it. Unfortunately, this Congress has a hard time even keeping a speaker in place without them trying to vacate the chair and topple the speaker. This Congress, as the whole country knows, has been absolute chaos and dysfunction and disorganization from the beginning. So I don't blame the people from Washington, D.C. who sent us these letters, the mayor, the council, the attorney general of D.C. from saying, uh, thanks, but no thanks, uh, we'll take it from here. The people in D.C. are perfectly able to decide what criminal offenses they need in the District of Columbia and how the sentences should be set and fixed. And they've got courts in the District of Columbia. They've got a legislature, the council of the District of Columbia, which is elected from their eight wards and four at-large members and a chairman of the council. And they've got a mayor. They've got advisory neighborhood commissions. I wonder if any of my colleagues over there are active in any of the wards or advisory neighborhood commissions where they live. I tend to doubt it. But the people of D.C., I understand from Congresswoman, Congresswoman Norton, are actually involved in the governance of their city and the management of their local affairs. And yet in this totally ham-handed and almost comically dysfunctional attempt to score points against D.C., they come up with legislation which says D.C. can never increase criminal penalties again when they're accusing D.C. of being too soft on crime, despite the fact that we're able to show that D.C. has tougher criminal sentences than uh, many of the states represented by the members who've been speaking about this over the last several days. So uh, all of it fe feels a lot to me like a silly election year stunt. I don't think anyone thinks that this is uh, serious legislation, um, but I am glad at least that the other side has conceded that the bill means what it says. They want to strip the District of Columbia of any power to increase criminal sentences uh, in their city. And I simply think that that is a, a terrible form of public policy and is a, a major inroad against home rule over the last several decades, when in fact what we should be doing is giving the people of D.C. greater political self-government and giving them the rights to equal representation, which of course was uh, the aforementioned Jefferson's ideal for the country. If you go back and read the Northwest Ordinance, he thought that every part of the country would eventually attain a level of political equality by admission to statehood through Article 4 of the Constitution. That's the spirit of the Constitution, not kicking around people who are fellow citizens because we think we've got more power than them and we can score some political points off them. Why don't we have a hearing about statehood for the District of Columbia and let's keep the engines of democracy, freedom, and political equality in the country moving. And with that, I will yield back, Mr. Mr. Jim from Maryland yields.